Hello and welcome to Dragon Bites, the paediatric podcast aimed at paediatric trainees or anyone interested in child health. I'm Asim, one of the paediatric trainees based here in Wales. This week we have the second of our coffee pods. For those of you unfamiliar with coffee pods, this is where Stacy or myself sit down with individuals working in or around child health and discuss their areas of personal interest. Stacy Harris recently caught up with Pomod Vallabhaneni. He's one of our general paediatric consultants based at Morriston Hospital in Swansea and has recently become the educational lead for paediatrics in Wales. He's a passionate and absolutely inspiring medical educator and so Stacy decided to have a chat with him about what drew him into medical education, any hints or tips he has for us as trainees, and what his plans are for medical education in Wales in the near future. Being someone who's recently fallen in love with medical education myself, I couldn't help but muscle my way into the conversation, so I'm afraid you're going to have to put up with me a little bit here too. Anyway, let's get started. So hi, um, my name is Stacey Harris and I'm going to be hosting today and I'm joined by Pramod Balbanani. He's the new education lead for paediatrics in Wales and um, Dr. Asim Tavade, who is the uh, lead for... Where are you? <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> I help okay, out we with, tra- this. with this Dragon Bites thing yeah. and, um, and then I'm the written exam lead for Wales That's as right. well. You're the written yeah. exam lead uh, for Wales. Uh, and we're going to talk about medical education today. Uh, which I'm really excited about because it's something that uh, I've realised is my passion. Um, <laughs> so I want I wanted to talk to you first about why you became interested in medical education. Um, what... Sure, thank you. Thank you both for having me today. So to answer that question, why am I interested in medical education? Uh, it goes back right to my med school days where you know you, you quickly notice that if you learn something you're sharing that with your colleagues and your colleagues tell you oh you did that in a reasonable manner that we could understand so it, it, it goes back I think you quickly realize you do have an interest or passion in teaching and also it's those teachable moments get more and more uh, I would say and I'm using the word addictive so teaching whilst it's a passion it's also an addiction because Once you do it better, and once you get your feedback, you want to do it better the next time. So interest in medical education has always been ongoing and will ongoing. I think the day it stops, then you stop growing in medical education. And both of you will agree with me, in today's day and age, medical education is the single most important vital aspect of improving patient safety as well. So if you see education for patient safety, I think medical education is critical. Yeah, well, that's wonderful. Really inspiring. What about you, Asim? Yeah, well, I, I mean, I couldn't agree more. That's fantastic. That's exactly how I feel about it as well. I think uh, looking back on things, I think the reason I got interested in medical education, I think the reason a lot of us get interested in medical education is that when we were learners, there were certain teachers that we can remember who were fantastic. You know, they gave us a lesson and you know, you just got it. The, the way they spoke, the, the way they taught, or more often than not, the way they drew the learning out of you um, is what, what made you really retain that knowledge and, and made, made you love that as a topic. Um, and I think the reason I got interested in medical education is I kind of wanted to emulate these people who I thought were, were amazing when I was in uni. Um, and then, yeah, just like Pramod says, you start teaching people and then people give you feedback and they're like, oh, that was really good. I love how you did this. And, and then you kind of get, you know, your ego gets struck a little bit. <laughs> then you, you kind of want to do better next time and the time after that. I 100% agree about that. Just adding to Asim's point, uh, John Milton Gregory, a very famous uh, person, said something about teaching is the best teacher always brings the best out of the student. Mm. And, and actually, to quote him, he says, the one who teaches best is who teaches the least. So you're stimulating the student. So whilst you might appear to you, you're teaching somebody, you're only stimulating them to go find the knowledge for themselves. So I, I, I found it quite a profound statement from John Greg, John Milton Gregory. No, it's completely mm-hmm. true. And it's, isn't that like, that's like the Socratic method of teaching, isn't it? You ask, you ask the, your learners what they, 
what you want them to learn, essentially, because he believed in innate knowledge, which I'm not 100% convinced by, but he believed that everyone has innate knowledge. And if you can draw that from them, you can come down to an underlying truth beneath it all. And I think that works really well and really effectively as, as a teaching method. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> this is getting quite deep and really interesting. Um, so, uh, so I, like I said, I've realised that uh, through doing these problems, that I really enjoy teaching but um, when I think about actually sort of doing a teaching session I always kind of feel like I lack confidence in my ability to to teach and I know that you at him have um, been doing lots of teaching and been doing um, some uh, skills you know you've been doing a course on it um, mm -hmm. and I was kind of want to get a bit of advice from you really um, with regards to uh, what I can do as a trainee to um, improve my my skills as a as a teacher really well, you've raised so many interesting points in one sentence i don't even know where to begin <laughs> stacy um uh, in terms of uh, just going back a bit i think in terms of lack of confidence as a teacher i think that's something that all of us feel because i think all of us have a degree of imposter syndrome in every aspect of our working careers as doctors and i think as teachers that comes in quite a lot as well and you're a bit worried that you'll get asked a question you don't know the answer to um, you know, that's that's always one of my yeah, fears. Exactly, yeah, exactly. Exactly. You just don't feel like you'll you know enough to be able to teach somehow. Exactly, mm -hmm. or that someone there will know more than you exactly. do, and you'll look like a fool in front yeah. of them. But actually, I think people have far more knowledge than they give themselves credit for. I mean, what what are your feelings about this, Pramod? I think when you ask to teach, and I I keep saying this, you see, the one who always offers themselves to teach are the ones who are always available. So I always say, while well, completely digressing from the question you asked, but it just come into my mind. See, if you ask what are the good qualities of a teacher, I always say F-A-T. I hope you... <laughs> Thank you. So F, uh, whilst I'm not using the word fat, but it, it's an acronym that I, I tend to remember. You see, a teacher should always be faithful. It's such a relationship word when you talk about teaching and being faithful. But faithful is about being true to that audience who've come to listen to you, who have said, okay, for example, Stacy's teaching me today, I'm looking forward to it. So you might be teaching on bronchiolitis. So a teacher who's faithful will always prepare. So to overcome that anxiety, you're focusing on two things. One is your preparation, and it is like preparation, preparation, and preparation is the key to get that confidence. So if you know the content matter in and out, and also you don't need to be that perfect teacher. I think that's what we need to remember. We don't need to know everything. It's okay to be an imperfect teacher because out of those imperfections, you will have your own drive to become better. So the student, I think, or you know, young trainees, doctors, don't always want the perfect teacher. They like imperfections in a teacher. So it's okay, but I think it's about being humble and saying, I don't know the answer to that, but I think that's a great question. So I think it's about preparation and then comes your presentation. We'll talk a little bit more on how modern day presentation should be, but completing my FAT thing, faithfulness, availability. So you see, to overcome that anxiety to teach, we should always be available. So for example, I will, I will try and teach whenever I can, if somebody asks me, because I feel, oh, if somebody's asked me, it is for a reason, but it's also for my own growth. So I always say, I will try and, teach any topic, Let, I'm, I'm saying if somebody asks me about astronomy, I might struggle, <laughs> <laughs> but, but, but you see, being available, and then also the T stands for teachable, are you teachable? So to teach, you have to be teachable, are you ready to learn and grow every day as a teacher? So you see, the word doctor, um, you know, I don't want, so the word doctor means to teach. And most doctors forget that. So you think, oh, I'm, I'm not good at teaching. No, whatever you do, you're mirroring teaching. Mm -hmm. So who you are inside and what you reflect on the outside, I think that's being a teacher. You don't have to literally shout at the rooftop and say, I am teaching, you're listening. You can just be yourself and that could be the teaching moment. <laughs> <laughs> oh, this is wonderful. Thank you. So we did, haven't even answered your question yet, Stacey, <laughs> <sorry>. <laughs> I know, <laughs> but I'm doing other things. Um, uh, Promo, do you have any, you know, in yeah. terms of actually improving, yeah. training, you know, trainees improving their own skills, what are your thoughts yeah. on it? So one is, 
use every opportunity in the department, mm -hmm. okay, to present, to teach, short teaching presentations, you know, try and meet your local program director and say, how can I get involved in the teaching program? But try and do a series of teaching presentations, but with every presentation, get feedback. You see, that feedback, I see when you look at portfolios in ARCPs, when trainees have said they've done teaching sessions, what's missing is what was the feedback? Because that feedback is your fodder to prepare better for the next time and show growth on the same topic or could be a different topic. But if you really want to formalize med ed, which I think in the previous days, if you said you had an interest in medical education, that was good enough. But I think we are in a day where medical education has completely transformed. If you look at last month itself, there are 100 plus publications in the field of medical education that is booming at a very fast growing pace. So if you want to know the basics of MedEd on how to teach, how to design a presentation, on you know teaching theories and how the students learn, how to make your teaching safe. So there is a very basic course I would recommend from the Association of Medical Education in Europe called Essential Skills in Medical Education. It is affordable. That was my first course in medical education as an ST7 and I think you, that could be your starting point. Not all of us could afford to go for a PG cert. I think that's one of our developmental needs, I suppose, in Wales, where we could see how we help our trainees who are interested in MedEd get that certification and find some monies for it. Um, so you don't have to formally do a course within your training years because of budget and money matters, but I think you can certainly start off showing your interest and your willingness by doing essential skills in medical education course. And I think they haven't changed the format. You can do it online completely. So you're doing it while it's within your time, but also you can do a face-to-face -face course, which is about four days. But also, I think hopefully in the future, if 2020, um, and sorry to digress from the topic, our future plans are that we arrange steady days for our trainees on doing like a day of master classes where we bring the best evidence teaching methods. What we shouldn't forget is whilst we apply best evidence to patient safety, evidence-based medicine, there is best evidence to medical education, which I think we need to start promoting. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I hadn't even thought about the evidence for medical education before and how we should be using that. Yeah, there's all, a, a whole host of publications out there now. There's like medical educate, uh, medical education, medical teacher, mm -hmm. clinical education. There's all sorts of journals out there now about it. Um, I just wanted to briefly go back to one of your points about feedback. I think uh, on a practical day-to-day -day level, one thing that can really help anyone become a better teacher is to really focus on that feedback. I think that we have a tendency, even on the occasions we do collect feedback, is just to give out these like forms, fill this in, tick what you want. Um, and then I'll collect it at the end, and then you can just put it on your portfolio as feedback. But actually, there's a lot of evidence now to show that you know these these forms get filled in sort of um, in a in an almost mindless way. People just tick things, put minimal amount of feedback written down, and there's actually a lot of and I per, this is from my personal experience as well. There's a lot of evidence to show that small focus groups, just sitting down with the group that you just taught and having a proper discussion with them, like what worked well when I was teaching you there? And is there something I could have done which would have made that better? And get more useful, rich information off them on what you could work on next time. It's actually probably, even though it's harder to then evidence that in your portfolio, it's probably more useful for you as a as an educator. Cool. Yeah. It's a really open way to do it, isn't it? Yeah. Um, and if you're looking for an absolute hot tip, recently I found on Twitter, thanks to Twitter, <laughs> it's, it's a medical student who wrote me on Twitter and I'm very grateful to that student. I heard it recently, so if you're looking at you know, what is the best evidence base for doing a presentation, if you're doing a presentation for 30 minutes, always only have 10 slides because it's you as the educator who has to, it's not the slide who has to convey the message and I'll also use you know, for example, if you're doing a 30-minute session, 20 slides would be a bit too much. But maybe if you're doing a 60-minute session, you got to. So what? What the key message there is: less is more. But we flood our presentations with too much, and then we're rushing. And I don't know if you've had the experience where some one of the speakers has said, "Oh, I'll skip that slide. I'll skip that slide." Yeah. I think you lose absolute credibility with the audience when you do that because you're saying. I prepared that slide, but it's not important 
So less is more, and maybe that that you can start applying it very easily from tomorrow if you were to change. I think less is more. Yeah. So um, you were just saying about what we can do from tomorrow. Is there anything else that you uh, you know you could give us any sort of tips really on what we can do as trainees to improve our skills and to get better and to just I, basically what is going to give me the confidence to like just go and teach tomorrow I suppose sure and and the first thing is you need to know your audience okay so in terms of communication which is at the heart of every presentation that you give you would ask yourself what exactly am I trying to tell the audience and the, uh, the key thing we all need to realize is we are teaching a very different generation and whilst you both are very young, I can only speak of myself here, <laughs> uh, is, you see, the way we've designed PowerPoint presentations are still quite archaic. So times have moved quickly. So what I would really like you all to think about is creativity in your presentations. With creativity, you will get that confidence. But how do you get creativity in a presentation? Say, for example, you're teaching the same topic, bronchiolitis. Medical students have heard it before. Can you really think of some way that you can bring the message differently? So what I think is very evidence-based is we all are very emotional beings because our limbic system is the most primitive of the human brain. So if you were to design a teaching presentation, I would always say start with a case because then you, your audience really gets what you're trying to say. Whilst you want to teach about bronchiolitis, you could start off the epidemiology of bronchiolitis, the viruses that cause bronchiolitis, and then you're bringing the case into the scenario. But I think what would really connect with the audience is bring that case on your first slide. Because then they're saying they like the challenge. The current day students or you know young generation like to know what is in it for me. So they want to see a connection to what you're teaching to their real life. Because you see, they, for example, if you look at the gaming, why, why do youngsters really like gaming? Because they get instant feedback. Because they're doing something, they're pressing a button, it's not working, so they try and do something different, they try and do something different. Or, I, I don't know if you watched cartoons these days. All the time. Yeah? Okay. <laughs> see, you see, if, you, if you're at my home, you'll be seeing a lot of Paw Patrol because you have no other choice. But what fascinates me with Paw Patrol, and I think you can apply this to medical education, is the fastness of the frames that keep coming. They call it short, snappy, you know, they put multiple stuff. It's not slow anymore. So the current generation is used to that pace of having multiple channels. So you can really go creative by using multiple channels in your presentation. Get a case video if you can. Rather than telling subcostal recessions, show them what subcostal recessions should, you know, really mean. So try and use multiple channels in your teaching. Not only just audio, which is which is you, which is you is it, but honestly, it is your gig. So if you were to go to, I know, ask him like rock music but if you, if you if you were to go to a rock music concert there's not just one person performing there's always there's something that comes before the main artist and then people who come in between so you see they're already doing that concept of multiple channels within the same session I'm so inspired. I'm like, wow, how, how can they make funky light? It's really interesting. <laughs> it, it's, it's, a, a promoter put this challenge to me once before. He was like, in your next teaching session, be go as creative as you can and just do something completely out of the box. And it's, it's a really good challenge to set yourself, I think. How can I teach this without teaching it in the standard form? Traditional format? way. Because I, I think maybe that's why I've been a bit, ref, you know, I haven't really felt like I've won not wanted to do it but I felt reserved to do it because maybe that actually teaching style doesn't suit me and, yeah, absolutely. and maybe that's what I need is just and to go just it teach well, it in the way that you would understand because I think I'm quite you know quite simple I understand things in quite a simple way and using you know sound and and yeah things like I think that. most people most people understand things in a simple way and probably it the reason it doesn't suit you as a as an educator is probably it probably equally doesn't suit most people as learners to just have endless sort of 
monotonous slides thrown at them, but actually mm. having a variety of things or things taught in a new and interesting way engages a new part of you because you then become entertained and you're more likely to remember what you're entertained by. Like I can remember far more from a David Attenborough documentary than I can do from my last lecture that I had on um, supraventricular tachycardias, you know, and it's, yeah. it's just because of the difference in the way that you get engaged in it, isn't it? Mm. Yeah, I'm so inspired. <laughs> uh, do you have any other tips that you've used, um, Asim? So a really practical one, I think. That, so I think one of the teaching events we're most involved with as trainees and probably even, uh, you know, as consultants is with supervised learning events. Um, so you know your mini cases, your dots. You, we do it for um, we do it for medical students. We do it for SHOs. We'll do it for regs and so and so on and so forth. Um, and I think there's I think there's a tendency. Um, for us to you you know to just tick it off and say yep yeah, you did really well you might want you might want to improve on this and not actually really sit down and engage with that as a learning process i think one of the most useful things i learned and going back to the sort of socratic method of teaching is sitting down with someone and then essentially you say minimal so sticking along the same principles as the slides from what mentioned earlier you should have your input at about 10 percent and let the other person you know, do 90% of the speaking. So you should say, so what did you feel went well with that, um, you know, I don't know, uh, lumbar puncture you just did? And then let them tell you about what they did well and then engage them a bit more about it. So don't let, just let them say that one chunk of paragraph. Say, oh, so yeah, well, going on to that, that did go really well. And what I liked about it was this. What did you really like about it? And similarly, there might be mistakes or, you know, things that could have been done a bit better that you've noticed. But instead of telling them, you could have done this better or maybe next time try this say i noticed that you know this element could have been uh, you know you didn't seem as comfortable with this element um, of that lumbar puncture process what are your feelings around it and then get them to draw out ways they can think about correcting it because so i think if you engage that part of your brain where you actively have to think about what you would do next time rather than passively hear about what might improve things for you you're far more likely to do that the next time round. I mean, that's just how I've always felt about it. I think that's what the evidence shows, and it's what I learned doing, you know, my my studying. I don't know if you have any. I completely agree with that. And again, if you go back to evidence-based medical education, there's a chap called Hattie who's proposed that I think this is the best work they've produced is formative feedback. Mm -hmm. The way you describe it is the single most beneficial thing for a student doctor or you know a trainee who's near completion as well. So that. You're providing feedback, direct feedback, okay, and then, you know, there's a different models of feedback, isn't mm -hmm. it? You know, yeah, coaching, pedagogy. mentoring, everything comes yeah. into way. But I've always remembered a good one is the cast model, where you say the feedback is constructive, it's accurate, it's specific, it is timely. I, I don't think any of our trainees would ever disagree with that feedback if it is timely. But often, this has been my experience in the past, and I think some of the trainees still experience it, feedback happens quite later after the event has happened. When you go to your midpoint meeting, mm -hmm. somebody might say, oh, can I just have a quick chat with you after the, this happened? And then you're thinking, oh, okay, it would be nice if I would have known then. Yeah. So you, you see, that timely feedback, I think, is the single most useful thing. And just adding to that, Ward rounds. You see, you could teach on ward rounds. I don't think you know you have to wait for that teachable moment of presentation. Consider the next time you're doing a ward round, a business ward round, which you're running through the cases on the ward. You got to get rid, get you know, see a lot of kids. Is if you have a junior with you, make that a TWR. I call it a teaching ward round, but be very explicit about it because often our juniors are scribes on the ward round. Do you agree yeah, with that? Yeah. Yeah. See, I think that has to go. You're not there just as a scribe anymore. In a single ward round, you could have four or five SLEs done. You might see five patients with your consultants, with, um, for you, uh, with your juniors, F2s, ST1s, ST2s. Do a teaching ward round with them. See every patient that you see, stop and say two things we want to discuss from that patient. Two things. You see, why it's important to narrow down teaching mm -hmm. moments is you remember better, but also you teach better. But also, not only you're doing a busy ward round, you've also made provisions for teaching on that ward round. Mm -hmm. 
And I think if we do this a bit like a little educational QI across South Wales, you will see most trainees will have no shortage of SLEs left. That is a wonderful idea. You know, that, that would make uh, both, I think that I would um, benefit from that from a teacher's perspective and also from a trainee's perspective if, if, uh, if I had that. Um, so promote uh, as as your uh, new role as the lead for education uh, for paediatrics in Wales. What are your plans? Oh, uh, the, the, I'm so excited about 2020. Um, and when I look at what's being done, I think the first thing we should acknowledge is, as a school of paediatrics in Wales, we've been very good with our deanery or HEIW led steady days. But the next 24 steady days in 2020. What I was quite keen to bring to them was progress curriculum into the study days. So, for example, if a trainee is attending a study day, the progress curriculum outcomes or learning outcomes will be clearly written down. So, if you can't meet it at work, and we want you all to come to the HEIW study days, is if you go to, for example, if it's child protection or safeguarding, you will come and get those learning outcomes within the day. So, this is the first thing we're trying to do is getting progress curriculum into the steady days. That's and, such a good idea. And I'm hoping it will appeal to trainees mm -hmm. to come and also see, okay, the program that we're delivering is aligned to progress curriculum. By the way, I'm a big fan of progress curriculum. So, <laughs> As um, am I. <laughs> yeah. and, and if you look at our new trainees coming into <coughs> T1 level, I think it would be really useful for them to see that. And the variety of um, steady days is quite exciting and also the other exciting thing and again going back to evidence-based medical education is we want to get near peer teaching into the steady days so this is a request for all the trainees out there if you're interested in delivering teaching sessions this could be a perfect opportunity Stacey, <laughs> of getting that confidence into a teaching session with your peers who are your fellow colleagues who will be supportive but also we know near peer teaching is a very evidence-based educational tool so we are trying to focus at least 10% of the study days, if we can, as near peer days. So that's an interesting uh, you know, new venture we're looking at. And the most exciting of all this is what I'm looking forward to is the 30th of June, 2020, where we're trying to host our first Welsh Pediatric Trainee Conference, a day of uh, celebrating trainees, the wonderful trainees that we have, uh, of the wonderful new ventures that we have, you know, for example, uh, whilst I'm here, I should mention about Dragon Bites. What an exciting, you know, idea. We didn't, we didn't and, pay uh, him for this. Absolutely, <laughs> yes. I get something out of the table at the moment. But, you know, um, Bren, again, a trainee-led initiative and our trainee representative. So uh, the, the theme of the day is to celebrate our trainees, but also go away with something really tangible that you can take back to your workplaces. So I'm really excited about the trainee conference. Again, we need a lot of training support for that. So, and also we're looking at timing of the steady days. For example, uh, we're looking at having neonatal steady days at the time of turnover, for example, March and September. So if you're going into neonates, which can cause, you know, if, if it's niche speciality, you haven't had exposure to it, if you come, it'll be a good refresher quite early at change over time. We're trying to bring some procedural master classes, and I've had um, a discussion with my colleague Joanne Webb in Singleton as an LPD, who's we've talked about how can we bring some procedural master classes into the steady days, especially in the afternoons, if you know postprandial dips. In. <laughs> yeah. So we're trying to see the design of our steady days and just bring a lot of evidence base to it, but also not make changes for the sake of changing it, mm -hmm. but really be demonstrating that we have a variety of things coming into it, but also conferring to the domains of progress curriculum. Yeah, fantastic. Um, all of those suggestions of uh, improvement would really yeah, benefit me, I think. Fantastic. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Especially if those, that the um, elements of the progress curriculum are made explicit at the start of the day. By the end of this day, you will have ticked this box, this box, this <laughs> box, this box. Put it on your portfolio now. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> that is really great. And um, something that I think as um, SHOs going into neonates and as a registrar who often hasn't done neonates for a long period of time, 
that would re- that would really really sort of alleviate lots of uh, stress really I suppose by just having that refresher because they are very di- you know the specialties are very different and you sort of have to ch- almost it feels like you have to change your frame of mind before going into it don't you exactly um, so that yeah that's particularly good. oh and, and one more point just to add to the plug about the trainee led study days because mm-hmm. I think this is a great initiative and for any of the trainees who are interested in good applications I think that actually organizing a study day does score you like something like one or two points on Absolutely. your grid application so yes. you know another another push <laughs> yeah and and also i think what i have to really acknowledge here is you see not all teaching uh, happens at a centralized steady day so i'm going to work really closely with the local program directors and each of them have been brilliant who've been willing to speak to me and listen to me and share ideas because if you improve teaching locally i think teaching will be our education will be good all across and the same trainees move between hospitals so I think it's better for Wales it's better for our trainees it's better for the whole wider picture mm. okay so um I have been so inspired by what you guys have said and um yeah I I feel something a bit deep inside me <laughs> I don't, um, yeah sorry that sounds a bit <laughs> but uh yeah you've like truly inspired me um to go ahead and just go and teach really um, thank you so much for all of the advice and um, sort of wisdom that you've given me and um, I really appreciate it <laughs> no thank you for asking and, and if I may just say it's okay to fail in teaching <laughs> absolutely failure is absolutely acceptable in teaching you know that you failed a teaching session but that's okay the next session you do it better but if you don't try it you don't make that first step you don't stand in front of that audience I think that that will only come if you push yourself to it. And just remember, it's okay to fail. And that was that episode of Dragon Bites. What an absolutely inspiring person Promote is to listen to. If he can't make you fall in love with medical education, I really don't know what will. Anyway, if you're interested in more information about medical education, please head to our website, www.dragonbitespodcast.com, where you can find an accompanying worksheet to go alongside this episode, which has um, links to all the things that Promote spoke about during the episode, plus links to other useful resources for medical education. Join us again next week for a respiratory quiz episode prepared by our very own fantastic Sophie Constantinou. That's all for this week. Thank you for listening to Dragon Bites.